Hey there, Paul Mark uh, with Transcend Coffee, and we want to talk to you a little bit about our very first 50 pound project. I've got Josh Hawkin with me, our director of green coffee, our director of coffee, and George Jeske, who's our director of training and wholesale. We're gonna, yeah, enlighten you a little bit today about this amazing coffee that uh, we know you're gonna love because we love it and uh, we wouldn't send you something that we don't love. So Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how this coffee came to be in the fold of the 50, count, 50 pound coffee project. Uh, so when I was in Costa Rica this past February and April, uh, I spent some time uh, cupping coffees in, uh, uh, in the exclusive coffees lab in San Jose, Costa Rica and we had talked to Francisco Mena from Exclusive Coffees about our desire to sort of showcase this 50 pound project that they've been working on for the last two years uh, to our own customers. Uh, and uh, I asked him just to, any coffees that he thought that might work for this program uh, to put on the table and we would choose some uh, for our customers back home. So this is a coffee, uh, comes to us from a mill called Puente Tarasu. It's uh, just uh, a stunning geisha from uh, a guy named R Rodolfo Rivera, a farm called San Martin 1900, which means it's from uh, 1900 meters above sea level. And we have Jordan here brewing some for us to taste. Uh, cool. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we love about the coffee, uh, how it expresses the, the, the Asian characteristics, uh, how we brew it, and uh, Jordan's gonna talk a little bit about his experience with the coffee as well. Cool, maybe just tell the viewers uh, a little bit about you said it's from Puente Terrazu. Uh, maybe just where is that Costa Rica? Why does it matter where it comes from? Uh, so this coffee, I mean, this mill is called Puente Terrazu. It's in the region of Terrazu in Costa Rica, which is just like sort of a, like south of the city of San Jose. When uh, where a coffee comes from matters because the climate, the soil, the microbiome in the area are going to affect the coffee. Uh, the people who grow it are going to affect the flavor of the coffee, as well as how it's processed and all that stuff. And, this is a coffee that's going to taste uh, like remarkable, like a clean, brilliant Panamanian dish. Cool. And maybe just uh, as well, Josh, Josh mentioned 1900 when we said it's 1900, 1900 meters above sea level. One of the things obviously that's really, that we love about high elevation grown coffees, um, and I always make this comparison in wine, is, is the, higher up the higher up the coffee grows in elevation, the longer it takes the fruit to ripen, and that lengthened uh, ripening process allows the fruit to develop much more interesting characteristics in terms of acidity and flavor profiles and all this stuff that makes coffee really, really interesting. The higher up you go, the better the quality of the coffee. It's no different than, than grapes. Uh, grapes grown in flabby, hot climates don't, don't have any character. And just like coffee grown at lower elevations, they don't have any character either. So that's why we're excited about these higher elevation coffees. So Jordan, why are we why are we brewing this coffee via pour over? Well, we really like the Hario V60. Um, we we like this one, and Josh and I selected it for brewing this for this coffee uh, because it's it's fairly quick. It produces a very clean cup that's really going to highlight the the more floral and, and citrusy notes of this coffee. It's going to really bring out a plate of the acidity. Really clean cup. Awesome way to brew a geisha or any sort of like more floral, more uh, fruity coffee. And for those brewing at home, what, what, what's the ratio? What are you, what are you, uh, how are you dosing? Uh, for this one, I did 21 grams of coffee, ground just a little bit finer than like an automatic drip, not much finer, and then 350 grams of water and it took about three minutes to brew. Cool. No stirring or agitation, just kind of straight ahead, simple, take the human error out of it. So what are we tasting, Josh? Right now it tastes like hot. <laughs> it tastes like hot. <laughs> but it smells incredible. And yeah, for, for those of you watching at home, when we evaluate coffees in terms of flavor and, and when we cup them professionally, cupping just means we're tasting them. Um, it's a coffee word, but it's really, really difficult to, to get your head wrapped around what something tastes like when it's super hot. Um, it's Number one, it's going to probably burn your tongue. 
And number two, it just, the muted flavor, it mutes flavors at a high temperature and it mutes flavors at a very low temperature. And so it's, it is really difficult to sort of get your head wrapped around what coffee, what the coffee really tastes like. So as, as much as we, we need to brew it while it's hot to, to get proper extraction, to really appreciate this coffee, let it cool down a little bit so that you can put it in your mouth, swish it around and, and savor, savor what, savor the flavors that come from it. All right. What is it? What does it smell like to you guys? Jasmine. Jasmine. Mm -hmm. it tastes like dried pineapple. I'm getting like tea notes, like tea, tea like tea like notes on the nose. I really love the acid in this coffee. Yeah, me too. I think that it's like easy to get scared by the term acid. Mm -hmm. uh, it implies something like harmful. Yeah. Uh, which is absolutely not the case. No, oh, and I think. People get scared of acidity when we talk about it in coffee, and, and frankly, everyone gets scared of it in terms of wine as well. But I think what's beautiful about this coffee is the acidity is very refined. Uh, the best way to sort of get your head wrapped around how you're reacting to the acidity in a beverage is what does it do inside of your mouth? So if you're, you know, our, our mouths like to stay in a basic state, and so if your mouth is reacting, trying to, and you get a lot of, you start getting, uh, salivating quite a bit, there's, that, that's evidence that you're putting something acidic in your mouth. But then you want to sort of start to evaluate, hey, is this, is this a pleasant acidity? Is it refined? Does it, make, does it make what I'm drinking or eating pop and have life and sparkle? Or is it drying and, and rough and it makes me kind of like, uh, you know, like a sour lemon where you just pucker it up. So, and I think what's beautiful about this coffee is that acidity is just super refined, right? It's just pleasing mm -hmm. in your mouth and it adds, it adds sparkle and, and life to it, right? Yes, that's mm -hmm. evidence of like a high grown late harvest coffee. Totally. Um, there's intense sweetness in this coffee as mm -hmm. well. Really, really interesting, like refreshing tropical fruit and citrus flavors. These are actually, like, so the, the floral qualities and the tropical fruit and citrus are actually like really heavily associated with this variety of, co of coffee, geisha, uh, which uh, Rodolfo actually got his seeds from a pretty famous Panamanian geisha farm called Mamacata. What I find with this coffee, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I will. but you will, <laughs> of course. That's why we work well together. Um, it really personifies those geisha qualities you were talking about, but I think it marries them really beautifully with the things that we all really love about Costa Rican coffees, like the high sweetness, and just like it, it has such a such a nice mouth feel. It's not for head geishas before where it's just floral and tropical fruit so and then like astringent. Kind yeah, of, yeah, astringent. There's no. It doesn't follow through nicely with any sort of um, like lower notes. Maybe the wrong word yeah. for it. But well, and it is sort of balance. Like if yeah, I go back, exactly. if I go back into the vaults of my mind and my memory to the first time I tasted a geisha from Panama. Right, that's 2008, 2009 when I was in Panama and obviously the Peterson's farm, that was the, that was a rage, right? There was this amazing new varietal that sort of launched onto the coffee scene. No one knew what it was. And it was this crazy flavor profile of Jasmine and, and really, really pronounced flavors. And I think what's interesting about this one is it's not quite, it's not that it's, 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 um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's, it's something, it, it's definitely different. It's, you can tell, you can taste Costa Rica in this, right? At, at least I can. Right? It's not a, it's, and I think that speaks a little bit to, obviously to all the, the, the components of it that you talked about earlier of place, uh, elevation, and also then all the processing that goes into it, right? And I think the other thing I want to say too, for those of you watching is, as we talk about the flavor profiles um, in coffee, just know that it's super hard. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that you don't feel intimidated as we talk about the flavors if you're drinking this coffee at home and you don't get those flavors because it is something that is really, really hard to do and it just takes practice. You have to practice, practice, practice and, and, rem and sort of work the flavor, flavor descriptors into your brain and then train your brain to recognize that when your tongue tastes in your tongue and your olfactory sense tastes it. Yeah, I mean, just because we're analyzing the flavors that we taste in the coffee doesn't mean that you have to do that. Just mm -hmm. drink a coffee, and if you like it, you like it. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. The best way to the best way to start is to savor, and so take some time. Take a slurp of this coffee, swish it around, and let your brain go. Hmm, what am I tasting? What about this coffee do I like? Heck yeah! Do you like it? Do you not? And then probe from there. What do you like about it? What don't you like? Totally. What does it remind you of? This is just how we all started. There's no special skill no. that that like we're born with. Like there's, there's no innate talent. It's just like repetition over many years.
if you don't have a pour over kit like Jordan brewed on today, how would you recommend brewing this at home, Jordan? Any brew method will work for this coffee. It's not kind of set aside for a certain type of brewing. Um, my basic tips are always, if it's a, any sort of drip method, like automatic drip, pour over, anything where the water is, there's new water continuously coming through it, I would do 60 grams of coffee for every liter of water, and then adjust your grind. If it's uh, too bitter, too strong, go coarser, too sour, too weak, go finer. For anything like a French press or an aero press, or maybe you're just using a jar, like whatever you want to do, if the coffee's steeping like tea, do more like 70 grams a liter and um, steep it probably about four minutes. Same thing with the grind. Don't grind too coarse with that, yeah. right? People, yeah. wanna, people really wanna grind very, very coarse, like like boulders. Big flakes. Uh, and uh, that's just, uh, that's a recipe for thin, muddy coffee. So we just wanna thank you for uh, joining us in this journey of celebrating some of the most amazing coffees that Costa Rica has to offer uh, in these small batches uh, and uh, because they're, yeah, they're super unique in terms of the varietal and where they're being grown. And, and it allows producers to experiment and, and play around. And we, we get the benefit of drinking, uh, drinking those experiments and being super, uh, yeah, just super excited about it. So, and as a teaser, Josh, what's coming next? What's, what's next month? Next up, we have a coffee from a little bit farther north, a little bit farther west in the West Valley of Costa Rica, a producer named Jaime Cardenas Rojas. Uh, if you've been with Transcend for a while, you'll know that he uh, has a farm called uh, Sin Limites. And this year, uh, we bought coffee from him uh, in, a, in addition to our usual amount. We bought a small amount of a variety from Kenya called SL28. And it's going to be really fun to be able to taste this and see what similarities it has to some typical Kenyan profiles. Uh, and compare that to see how that, that behaves in Costa Rica and how the processing that he's put into it uh, will uh, make an impact. So I really hope you enjoy that one as well.